Thanks for joining us again. My name's Elaine Haney. I'm a city councilor here in Essex Junction. And this is part two of a conversation with economic development professionals in Vermont about what's possible. And we're having these conversations just to envision a little bit what we might be able to do in Essex Junction to jumpstart our economic development plans and to coincide with our strategic planning exercises that we've been doing and to get everybody motivated to work together to do the work that's necessary in the future to make Essex Junction a really vibrant downtown, which we currently have, but that we have so much more that we could be doing together. So um, today I'm joined by Katie Trouts, who is the executive director of Montpelier Live, which is the downtown organization for our capital city. Welcome, Katie, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. So Katie, what I'd love to do is um, <clears throat> hear from you for a few minutes about who you are and what Montpelier Alive is, and maybe a little history of the organization. And then um, we could have a little conversation. I have a bunch of questions for you, and then perhaps we can open it up to audience questions. Does that sound good? Sure. Awesome. So please tell us about Montpelier Alive and how it got to be the powerhouse that it is now. <laughs> um. Well, I uh, I joined the organization not too long ago, so I'm still familiarizing with the history. But um, I and I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I um, was a full time professional musician for many years, and I had managed a couple of small nonprofit arts organizations. Well, one of them was a little bigger, Chandler Center for the Arts in Randolph. So um, built up interest in working in the nonprofit sector and um, definitely working in the arts for many, many years. Um, I took time off to uh, have my kids and, and raise them through their early childhood. And then as I was getting back into the workforce, I noticed there was an event coordinator position at Montpelier Alive open. I had had my eye on the organization for a while because I knew that they managed some pretty excellent events downtown. Mm -hmm. Some that had become quite well known, like our July 3rd celebrations. Moonlight Magic is a, a shopping spree event downtown that very obviously were very popular and um, economic drivers. So I admired Montpelier Live's work, and I saw that that uh, director, Dan Groberg, who had been there for about five years or four years when I came on, um, had done a lot with the organization to build the visibility and kind of show um, that Montpelier Alive was behind a lot of the events, beautification, um, and uh, business support in certain ways. Um so slowly, Montpelier Alive was becoming uh, more of a clear organization <clears throat> that was doing good work to make Montpelier seem like a vibrant place. I was living in Cabot at the time. Um, so I applied for this job, and because of my background in the arts, I, I got the part-time event coordinator position and eased back into the workforce. Um, during my time there, Dan Groberg had built the organization to house himself as a full-time director and myself as a part-time event coordinator. And that it had been that way for a little while. And before, I think my predecessor as the event coordinator, then um, I believe the directorship was only part-time since its inception. So just speeding up a little bit, Dan Groberg um, was going to leave and I became interested in the executive directorship job and I had experience in arts um, nonprofit management. So um, with my experience with Montpelier Live, I had learned a lot from Dan Groberg and was able to take that job in February of 2023. And um, so I'm still new to the directorship. I've been there just over a year or almost a year and a half officially. Um, I did some work while Dan was easing out of his position before February of 2023. But then of course the flood hit and it kind of sped up my knowledge of economic development, business support, um, disaster relief and recovery. It's really expanded my skill set and the organization immensely. Um, so I'll speak to that. 
But um, I've now been able, since the flood ha- and things have calmed down in Montpelier a little bit, I've been able to spend some time with the history of Montpelier Alive and get to know what these organizations across Vermont and actually across the nation are meant to do. They're not just meant to recover towns after flooding experiences, but I'm starting to get to work on some of the things that um, I set out to do back in um when I took the job in last February. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like, I could say a little bit about Montpelier Life's history and how it grew into what it is. um, Now that I've talked about myself enough, Um, Montpelier Alive uh, was born out of a huge community desire to see downtown Montpelier be uplifted. Um, there was there were community members who saw the potential in the small city. Um, I remember growing up in Vermont. Uh, I grew up in Cabot, and I would go to Montpelier. But there really were not a lot of stores. Uh, there were very few eateries. There are few good spots. But what you could see in that downtown, um, the capital of Vermont, was a whole lot of potential. And I think that was around the 80s that the community started speaking up about this. And I see in our history that um, there were there were, were various economic development um, kind of entities or groups that tried to hold that vision for Montpelier and move it forward in certain ways. But it was in 1999 that Sue Minter um, helped to create Montpelier Alive. And it was under the name of Montpelier Downtown um, Community Association. And the idea was to revitalize Montpelier. And some of that would be economic development Um, restoring historic buildings, improving housing, designing walkable communities. I think the ambitions were pretty big at the time. Um, But also with her help and with the community's help, some of the greatest events um, that benefited the downtown in terms of economic vitality were created, such as um, Art Walk and Brown Bag Concerts, um, Holiday Decor, uh, and July 3rd, and among others. And these events still exist today. They're extremely successful in bringing people downtown, and they're really at the center of that revitalization effort, um, putting Montpelier on the map as a destination, and also community building all the while. So 1999 is when the organization was born, um, and it had part-time directors Uh, up until Dan Groberg, who uh, took the reins in 2015 or 20 something. And um, throughout time, Montpelier Alive kind of grew out of that events organization and helped with the city, partnered on beautification efforts. Um, I think in the past 10 years, we've been responsible for downtown flowers, holiday decor and illumination um, and giving input in like some of the city planners plans for um, designing, you know, a a downtown that the community wanted to see. So walkability, uh, sidewalks, uh, bike friendly streets. So Montpelier Alive uh, was leaned on as um, one of the community partners for input. Um, And we get a lot of our input and feedback from the business community. So Montpelier Alive also started working really closely with the businesses um, to help ensure that uh, they were successful in our downtown and also to help fill empty storefronts. Um, There are so many different ways I could go into uh, that we do that, but... um, but we work continuously with business owners and communicating with them, professional development opportunities, um, and trying to meet their needs as best we can or, or re- help them find resources that they need. So it seems scattered, all the many things that we do between events, beautification, working with businesses, and then marketing Montpelier. We became responsible for... Um, 
creating brochures and a website where visitors could find what they needed. Um, we don't have a visitor center right in our downtown. We did have the state visitor center, which now doesn't exist because it was flooded out. But Montpelier Live has always been a resource for people who wanted to know what was happening in town, where to stay. Um, and we continue to be that resource. Over time, I will say that Montpelier Live's work started developing um started fitting into a framework of what we call the four points of Main Street America. And Main Street America, um, which you may have heard of, is a national program that helps downtown organizations like ours and like other uh, towns that have a potential organizations sprouting up, um, helps them um, with the framework that's needed to do all of those things. So it seemed, like I said, kind of scattered what Montpelier Live was doing over the past 10 to 20 years because we were dabbling in so much. Well, Main Street America came forward with the four-point model of focusing our organizations on economic vitality, which is really that business support, um, and uh, ev uh, events, and beautification, and marketing. And the marketing and events can go hand in hand. Um, and some people call the fourth point actually organization. So that means sustaining your very own organization. So spending time, your organization spending time on itself to be sustainable. So by following these four points, I think that organizations like ours um, across the nation have been able to ensure that they're meeting those community needs that lie within those four points. And it's been really helpful to kind of direct our work forward. That's I so didn't mention cool. that Montpelier Live is a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We were founded as a nonprofit, but um, we also have a city budget allocation. Okay. Um and I'm trying to remember when that happened. I'm reading, I can share the history, the document of the history with you after this, but. Katie, um, can, we, can yeah. we pause for a minute and just yeah. sort of do a little recap? And then I'd love to talk more about the finances shortly. A um, couple questions I have. Um, so is it safe to say that Montpelier Alive evolved out of a um, events-based model early on, like you were doing the sales and those kinds of things. And you said several times that you took on the responsibility of, and I'm curious how that happened. Like, what was the, the catalyst of someone saying, well, we should ask Montpelier Alive about that. Like, how did that happen? Well, I think that it was noted that the city didn't have that um, capacity to run events for the downtown. And um, there might have been other organizations or people who wanted to have events downtown, but there wasn't an organization that could really hold all of that with the goal of it being an economic driver and um, a way to market Montpelier with the kind of vision that maybe the city um, and the community both had. Mm -hmm. uh, so Montpelier Life kind of filled that gap um, and also called it community development and economic development, but it was the, the component of economic development and community development um, that lied more in the events and economic drivers kind mm -hmm. of realm. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and when you first started doing this work, I know you weren't there at the time, but I'm curious how much the businesses were involved initially versus how much they're involved now, because I'm guessing that like a small business owner, they're already working 80 hours a week. And like, did they also contribute labor or money to the effort or was it just strictly Montpelier Alive would put something together and the businesses would sort of participate by opening their doors for certain hours or handing out flyers or offering a discount or something? Um, I can't be 100% sure right now, but what I do know is that um, we do have a membership program 
for businesses. Mm -hmm. And I am not sure when that started, but I doubt that that's how the organization started. Mm -hmm. I think I'm reading here um, and that like businesses and storefronts, they participated in the events and knew it would be good for them to be a part of the events. Um, but that that wasn't the foundation of the funding that the organization needed to start. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really good question as to where the initial funding came from. I'm reading through here to see if it mentions that, but I can find out. I, you know, I, there's been multiple business organizations that have started in Essex Junction and the town of Essex over the years. And um, one of them was the Essex Business Professionals Association, which actually put on our Memorial Day parade for a very, very long time. But that those folks, you know, retired, moved on. And so now the parade has moved under our rec department and we don't have a business organization anymore. And so in the fits and starts over the years, I've been part of those and business owners have been, you know, like, I don't have time to be on your board. I don't have time to be the volunteer who makes the phone calls and makes the copies and I'm busy running my business. And so it seems like business owners, in, at least initially, sort of need to receive some sort of evidence that the programming works and that they don't have to be the ones responsible for putting it on. Would that be accurate? Yes, absolutely. We do have bis some business owners who are more involved than others currently, but um, it is really hard to get business owners to um, be a driving force behind mm -hmm. uh, behind it all. But they are essential to uh, the the picture, and I think they they know um, that is beneficial to them the work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, but we're always trying to get more business involvement. It is hard for them um, being, you know, business owners and and needing to attend to. Yeah. And, and you have a lot of um, retail in Montpelier, but some of it's not. And so how do you engage businesses that don't have front door traffic? A great example is a long conversation I had today with, um, a place called the Greenway Institute. It's uh, Vermont College of Fine Arts has sold their buildings on in Montpelier to another institute called Greenway Institute. And it's not downtown and it's not a retail business and it's not a storefront. And in fact, they don't even have a sign up yet. Um, they will eventually, but, um, but they are so, ben their presence is so beneficial to our downtown. Um, that in our conversations, we talked a lot about like how Montpelier Alive could help with an awareness that they're, they exist and spread the word that they're, they're here and um, they're a part of our community, um, but also to uh, kind of advocate that like having a business like that, even though they're not downtown, um, is essential to kind of the landscape of having a diverse business community. Um, each business has a role that supports the other businesses. We saw that really clearly with the flooding as businesses, some businesses didn't pop, pop up and weren't able to bounce back. But, um, but Greenway Institute is one of many businesses that Montpelier Alive uh, supports and promotes and tries to integrate into like the landscape of the whole business community. They play a role, but they aren't directly a retail or storefront business. They may not participate in events, but they could sponsor an event mm -hmm. and um, have benefits from that. And it's also benefiting us to be able to run the downtown events. It sounds almost like you're a chamber of commerce in many respects. Many people notice that but we do such a variety of things that mm -hmm. we function pretty differently than a chamber of commerce mm -hmm. um we do hold some of those pieces uh in a similar way but okay so let's talk about finances because you had started going down that road and um from us i'm curious what the difference was from the beginning if you can figure that out to the current financial situation of Montpelier Alive. Like you said, you're in a, mem a membership organization now, but you weren't at the start. And I'm very curious about how much 
Montpelier as a city, the municipality, has participated in the formation and the funding and um, the general operation? Like what have been the interactions between Montpelier Alive and the city of Montpelier? Well, I think the the start of Montpelier Alive um, as the Downtown Community Association uh, was really trying to fill that gap. Uh, and they noticed that the city wasn't able to do all the things that the downtown needed to be revitalized. And so from the very start, it was a partnership between the city and the downtown association. Um, in fact, an early director of Montpelier Live then became mayor. Um, and there's a lot of that interest um, and kind of crossover and cross pollination between people who work for the city and people who have worked for Montpelier Alive. I think there's a lot of common goal and interest, but we're just really supporting their efforts in um, in supporting the city itself. Uh, so I think from the start, it has been a partnership. Again, I'm not sure when we got a budget allocation. It could have been that the sit that's how this organization started. Um, but as a nonprofit, which uh, I know that we got our nonprofit status um, shortly after 1999, mm -hmm. um, it diversified those funding streams. And so uh, we're able to get grant funding. Uh, we started this business membership program um, and uh, corporate sponsors. That, that mm -hmm. makes up a big piece of it as well. And I, I could be pretty sure that we had that kind of um, investment from uh, large employers early on as well. It seems like an essential piece of our funding stream and a pretty big piece of it as well, especially in talking about events and um, being able to run our events from the beginning. So... Can you tell us a little bit about what your current budget is and and how maybe percentage of what that is of personnel versus operations and that kind of thing? Just in a broad strokes, you don't need to reveal the secrets. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, so when I came on board, our budget had settled in around 260,000, um, 265,000. Um, and as a nonprofit, we try to balance our budget. So that's in and out. And, um, I'm not sure again, what it started as, but it, it, that was a pretty sustainable place for us. I will say that since the flood, because of our fundraising efforts and, um, the immense need that we are trying to meet, um, we were able to grow our staff and grow our budget. Uh, it has doubled. So right now we're at 475,000. Mm -hmm. um, I don't expect that to continue at that level. I think in the next couple of years, it might come back down to 300, um, something like that, which I think is fairly common. It's it's maybe a little higher of a budget than some of our other long-term um, organization partners, um, you know, organizations like us that have been around for a while. But what um, that budget can sustain include has included previously this full time director and a part time um, person. And for us, that was event and marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, many organizations have that kind of um, staffing model. Um, and we get the other uh, benefit to being a city partnership from the beginning is that we are housed in city hall with the city mm -hmm. and so we have offices there we use their resources their you know coffee machines and internet and computer so that really saves a lot on overhead that some organizations don't have um that benefit so that keeps our operations to um i think in a uh, about half the budget would be operations for us. Mm -hmm. I think typically maybe a little less than half of mm -hmm. our um, budget. But this year, because we were able to add staffing, 
and actually our operation needs grew with mailings and the use of so many office resources that our operations budget has grown. We're also offering um, healthcare stipends, um, much better healthcare stipends than before. So we count that towards our like um, employee costs, which lies under operations as well. So it's changing and we're growing. Mm -hmm. um, but I would I would say confidently that about half of our budget is dedicated to operations, mm -hmm. a little less than half. Okay. And in terms of, so you're the director and you um, have a couple staff members. Do you also have a board and what is their role? Yeah, the board has been essential to the whole situation from the start. It's always had a board. Um, and... The board of directors, like any nonprofit, um, we have bylaws. And um, I think that boards for any nonprofit function a little differently. It's very customized. Um, for us, this model works pretty well that the board has committees that help with the organization itself. Again, it's kind of like if this is the fourth point attending to our organization for sustainability, then our board works very hard on the internal functions. So we have a finance committee mm -hmm. that meets monthly and that's made up of maybe three board members. We have um, 10 to 12 board members at any given time. Um, and then we have a, a membership and development committee that's kind of like a fundraising committee, um, less in the like, I'm going to go out and send letters for you or meet with donors for you and more in the like strategic um, fundraising vision. Mm -hmm. We have a very complex and extensive development plan that's looking five years out and we update that every year and we work really hard on <clears throat> that strategy. So that committee works on that. And then we have a board development committee and that's focusing on, getting new board members and um, all the details of their terms and what the needs are and a board matrix and things like that. They also attend to, um, uh, I don't know, other kind of internal, um, some internal operations stuff. Um, each committee, as I said, meets monthly and then our board meets every three months. It sounds like a really mature organization that runs on a really well-oiled machine basis, um, which is not what a lot of, you know, downtown organizations are. You guys have really benefited from great governance and mission and, and funding, frankly. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's taken a long time. So right. Yeah, 1999, and then even the idea of it born in the 80s, um, it's really taken a long time to get here. Yeah. But I really think Main Street America has offered some of the guidelines and framework that have been really helpful to focus our direction and, um, and therefore been able to thrive and grow. Nice. Yeah. So would you, what would you say, like, from... Montpelier Lives early start to now, like what are some of the changes that have come to Montpelier that you might be able to credit to having an organization like Montpelier Alive? We have a really good storefront um, ocu occupied rate. So mm -hmm. very low vacancy rate is what I'm trying to say. And I think that's a reflection of people wanting to do business in Montpelier because we, as a partner, I will never credit all the work to our organization. We really lean on a lot of relationships, a lot of donors and the city to do our work. But um, I do think that we have helped bring Montpelier to a place of um, – of success where if you're a business owner interested in doing business in Montpelier, then it's very alluring um, to be there knowing that there are events that bring people downtown, reliable events that have been 
you know, ongoing for years and years and very popular, that there's an organization that's focusing on marketing throughout the year, especially during slower times of year to make it viable for a business to continue doing work there. Mm-hmm. Um, I also see the impact of the organization through our beautification efforts. I mm-hmm. know that the city does not have the capacity to put out potted flowers and hanging baskets and all of that um, at all. (laughs) And I think, you know, if you imagine the streets without that and in the winter without, um, we do garlands and lights. And this year we're doing a huge illumination project we fundraised $100,000 for. We've wow. fixed some of the city electrical infrastructure to be able to do more illumination projects downtown. And they wouldn't be able to do that without an organization partnered with them to fill those gaps. Mm-hmm. That's really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't want to, I want to be able to open it up to questions from folks in the audience, but this has really been illuminating in terms of talking about how a small organization can have enormous impact on the vitality of the downtown. And by starting out with like fair, not, not, not super small efforts because every effort that you undertook is, is, is work on your part, but things like sales and parades and, and, you know, lighting and holiday decor, I mean, those th- and beautification flower pots, like that means something and um, can be built upon. So I really want to compliment you and your predecessors on making that organization so viable and and such a necessary part of Montpelier. Um, You really made Montpelier a place to be. So that's really, um, congratulations and thank you for that. Um, I'd love to offer, offer the opportunity now for anybody in the audience who'd like to ask Katie some questions. I'm guessing you have some. Feel free to raise your hand. Chris. Katie, uh, do you guys, uh, you probably can't tell me this, but are you behind the Valentine's Day phantom? <laughs> well, Everybody wants said, to know. <laughs> Montpelier Alive, I think actually to speak a little bit to your points, um, Elaine, in that Montpelier Alive has also been like a trust builder and a relationship builder um, for the city, but um, in and of itself as well. And so um, we gain, we gain so many partnerships through um, the trust that we've built with community members, with other organizations. So I'll say that we are a partner in um, some phantom activity. We facilitate making great things happen in our downtown because people trust that when they ask for help to make something happen, that we will be there for them Mm -hmm. and we'll do our best to make a good idea sprout into something. So no, I'm not the phantom, but, um, but yes, we, we support that endeavor and we help make connections for the people who want to do things like that yeah it wasn't a denial (laughs) (laughs) and i will say that trust building i i haven't really mentioned this or gone into it too deeply but really a very important part of having an organization like us um a nonprofit partner to the city is that there's a lot of community at different times depending on what the political um, you know, political uh, atmosphere is and your city's dynamics, there can be distrust in the city. And um, I mean, your, your eye brows are going up. It's like, we all know this. And so having an, um, a more kind of neutral entity that can uh, be more flexible and nimble, but try to um, support good things and uh, have and hold that community trust is really important. It's important for the city to be able to move forward on, on things as well. So that is a a big role that we play. Hmm. That is a great point. Uh, Any other questions for Katie? Chris, you stole my, my phantom question. (laughs) (laughs) I was was wondering that too. I mean, I don't know. I just, uh, I just, support the effort. 
Thank you. I thought I saw Luke put his hand up. Yeah, uh, I, I was wondering if Montpelier Alive plays any role in the built environment uh, with any kind of facade granting or, uh, you know, if there's like a, a vacant space working to fill that specific space. Absolutely. Um, in terms of facade, I mean, those are great examples. Um, in terms of facade, uh, you know, we we keep our eye on things. We're like also eyes on the ground and in our day-to-day -day conversations with business owners, um, we tell them about opportunities that are available to them through the state or the city to improve their spaces, their facades. We can also advocate for them. So if the city is pushing back on a design or um, has questions, th then we can advocate for the businesses to um, if we feel like it would help with that economic vitality or the vibrancy of downtown, then we often will be that advocate for the business community. Mm -hmm. um, we have had we have had grant funding to support new businesses opening in town. We're always on some sort of pro we always have some project idea. And I know that right before I came on board as, as the executive director, um, I think it was a post-COVID effort. We received some funding as a grant to be able to run a grant program for businesses that wanted to open um, in some of those empty storefronts or expand their businesses. So we've done that before. Um, and then uh, there was a second part of your question or uh, another example. Um, yeah, filling empty storefronts. So that's one way. Right now, after the flood, we have about maybe between five and seven empty storefronts, whereas before the flood, they were, it was like 99% full across town. Um, and what I'm doing currently is uh, working with property owners um, to market their market their spaces but lightly not like a an agent for them but i people come to montpelier alive when they're interested in doing businesses so if i can keep tabs on the spaces and have a good relationship with the property owners i can facilitate some of um, those connections um, we in fact are thinking about this happens a lot actually for downtown organizations to move into an empty space mm. to help brighten up the town, but also to kind of market that space with the property owner um, and make it look beautiful and say, this space is for lease. We're here showing it off. Um, so that's another thing that our organizations can do. We can be so um, flexible in how we do our work, which is a great benefit to uh, a nonprofit. Hmm. That's awesome. And Other we questions? do uh, one more one more note about that. We um, often will give our input with like city plans or like a master plan um, just from our experience and also being kind of the voice for the downtown <clears throat> business community. Um, we give our input to those big planning um, things that can really make a difference with like streetscape and design. Um Right now, they're working on a new city plan for Montpelier. It's going to take about a year, but I'm going to be meeting with the economic development person and the planning because we actually do have an economic development specialist hired under the city. Mm -hmm. So I work with them and the planning department to talk about what the needs are for our downtown. It's important that a downtown be walkable and bike friendly. And um, I get to be the advocate for some of those things that I know would benefit Montpelier down the road. Hmm. More questions? Katie, what are some of the, the biggest challenges you've had or the biggest obstacles that you see <laughs> currently and, you know, in the future besides the rising Winooski? <laughs> that, that's That's it. Uh, that's it's such a huge concern is mm -hmm. um <clears throat> excuse me climate disaster and the flooding here um i think what happened with the flood is it also surfaced certain challenges that ran a little deeper mm -hmm. um 
And for our organization, it became clear that um, that the city doesn't and didn't have the capacity to um, <clears throat> always meet the community where it's at and address needs. And in that case, address pretty um, profound needs. Um, and so I think one of the challenges that lay ahead is um, how can we support the city even better because it's clear the city needs that. Um, so how can we grow our capacity <laughs> to meet those gaps that um, have arisen since the flood, which are, there are many more. And, um, and then also like figuring out really what our role is um, going forward, knowing that. So like we can't be everything to everybody and the city needs to hold like a certain amount of mm. economic development and revitalization themselves. Mm. So kind of actually on the list of things to do this year is we've never had an MOU written on paper between the city and our organization. Mm. Mm. And so um, it was something that surfaced from the flood that like now the community's a little confused about who to lean on for what. And even the city and our organization are a little confused about like the roles going forward because they've changed a little bit. Um, that's like a new challenge. And I think the MOU will really help with that. And um, and I think they'll become more clear at the farther away we get from the flood event. Other challenges we've encountered and <clears throat> continue to encounter is that I mean, there are many, but I find with my role, like, you can't please everybody. And probably as a city councilor, um, you know, we're here, we're here to help and to improve our towns and listen to the community, but you can't always get it right. And, um, and you can't be everything for everybody, as I was mentioning. And so, um, the challenge being um, trying to make choices that are within our realm of accomplishment um, that we can actually handle, <clears throat> and it may not it may not meet everybody's needs. It may not um, always be exactly what people want to see happen. Right now, we're we're struggling with um, like many restaurants don't want food; they want food trucks to be. Um, what's the word, uh, uh, not outlawed, uh, not, uh, not allowed, not allowed yeah. permitted, um, in downtown Montpelier because they think it draws away from the restaurants, but Montpelier live feels like food trucks can really animate a space in an event and it can draw more people to the downtown. So for the bigger picture, they're beneficial. So we encounter those types of conflicts all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we just do our best to to weigh all the input and try to make the right decision for the city. Hmm. Interesting. It's public service. It's, it's hard. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I was looking at your website and um, it looks to me what we had before that Elaine mentioned was the what was known as the EBPA. That was 20 years ago. Um, and it was the uh, Business Association. But I don't think it was really an association of businesses. It was more citizen based. And then the uh, but it looks to me like you also have a development corporation in Montpelier. Is that active? And how do you relate to the uh, development corporation? So that was a, a little experiment. Um, I don't know how many years ago that started. Um, but again, it's kind of like Montpelier Alive supports the city by doing these certain things, but there's still yet a gap. And um, that is one of the challenges our city really faces. We've got an economic development specialist who works with the city planner but really what's needed is like a committee or a group to be working along with that economic development specialist 
as citizens, um, you know, to have that group input, but also capacity wise to be able to do things that maybe that one economic development specialist can't do himself. Um, so they started the economic development group and, um, and that group hit so much conflict with, um, I forget if it was with the city or with the community, but they were not able to push forward on some of the ideas or, um, yeah, ideas that they had agreed on would be great for the city. And there was too much contention. And I, I believe they disbanded because they felt like they couldn't get anything done. <clears throat> Can you just give one example of what what was contentious about economic development? So um, there there was a concept to build a parking garage. Oh yeah, right down down near the uh, right right at the tracks there, right? Yeah. So, yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah, um, and oh. I think most everybody was on board with it, um, but then the council or the management, I don't know all the details, but received pushback from uh, enough community members or a few community members with power over that location that the um, the whole project just came to a screaming halt. Yeah, I saw that. I think that, that was really frustrating because it was very um, long in the making and they went through all of the community input sessions yeah. and um, did everything right leading up to it. And they still encountered like a barricade from certain people who didn't want to see it happen. Yeah. So I think that is a track record that Montpelier has is we have um, we've always it's always going to be difficult to make change in terms, especially of <clears throat> like the built landscape and and development the, in the curse community. of engaged citizens right yeah. <laughs> yes exactly and it's it's also the vermont way you know it's really hard oh, for course. people to see change here um, but it has to happen so i think you know i i hope that a development group or committee can happen again i think it's really valuable but I think that particular group got really burnt out on investing so much time and energy and and maybe even coming into conflict with the city about the outcome of that project. Um, so, yeah, that happened, I think, a couple That's years okay. before I came on. They disbanded. Katie, um, do you ever, does Montpelier Alive ever brush up against a need in the city for human services like um, homelessness, substance use disorder, care. You know, what are the pressures on your organization to perhaps step into that realm? Yeah, it, it is definitely an issue here. And we saw it magnified by the flooding, um, mental health and, um, and more unhoused. Um, issues in our in our town and um again we kind of we see it as uh i mean i as a citizen see it in many different perspectives in light but um as our organization and a part of our mission is to well our whole mission is to revitalize downtown and make it a vibrant place an attractive place for people to come as visitors or to stay and so anything we can do to support um, any activity that would uh, would help our downtown thrive um, and be vibrant and all those things is something that we will dabble in. And so, for instance, right now, and the business community is very motivated around this as well, because they they're seeing it in front of their eyes, their stores all the time. Um, they're the eyes on the ground watching the downtown kind of change and move through some of these challenges. Uh, people sleeping in their alcoves or their um, storefront space and then, um, you know, like needing to address, address overdoses themselves. 
So I've started to work with uh, CVMC, the hospital. We're talking about placing Narcan boxes around town. So that's, you know, there are projects like that that I can facilitate um, and connect entities that want to <clears throat> make a difference with business owners who want to be a part of seeing change and helping. Uh, another business owner has taken it into their own hands to create, um, she's, it's, they're making them now, these artistic like boxes that are on the street where people can donate money um, instead of giving money to panhandlers. Mm -hmm. And um, if it's successful with like three or four boxes around her storefront area, um, or, or that part of the street, then we might put them all over town um, as ways to collect money that then would go to, um, you know, an entity that is supporting uh, the unhoused or um, something like that. So we're still working that program out. But what I can do is then facilitate even just nuts and bolts, like talking with the Department of Public Works about like, what are the regulations and limitations that this business owner should know to be able to do this? And again, advocating for like, if it's a good project that will help our downtown, then we want to do what we can to help see it happen. I really am just so struck by the success of Montpelier Alive and, and the many different ways that it touches the city. You know, it's so clearly not just supporting businesses. There's so much more to it. And I think we could probably go on for another hour, but we are up against our time. And I really want to thank you, Katie, for taking the time to talk to us and really showing us what the possibilities are. We're, we're just, we still have our training wheels on and we're getting ready mm -hmm. to do great things, but we know I can look to Montpelier Alive as a model for what we might be able to accomplish up here in Essex Junction. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think, um, you know, you start with something. You just start with something and um, and you build your organization from there and you build that community trust and, and the relationships. <clears throat> and then you grow you grow and you change. And that's one thing I'm realizing about our, our organization, even since I started a little over a year ago, the community need has changed. And so we have pivoted um, to help in the ways that we can, but still maintaining our mission and our goal of revitalization and, um, and vibrancy downtown. It can just mean so many different things. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. Best of luck for the summer. I hope you all, all your stores have a fantastic summer. And um, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. And um, we are recording. I will make sure that everyone gets a copy of the link. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. And thank you again, Katie, for sharing about Montpelier Live. Yeah, thanks, thanks Katie. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, thanks. Have a good, good night. night, everyone. Bye.